Hey, Venkat. Welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm glad to have you on today. Hey, Lisa. Welcome back to Scorpio Season. Uh, so today we're talking about the letter G. Um, do you have a snack that you're eating? Yes, I do. So today's snack is G for Girl Scout cookies. So these are samosas. <laughs> oh, cool. Samosas are good. Those are the ones with caramel, right? And coconut? Uh, yeah. Coconut chocolate and it's donut shaped so mm, sounds tasty they're my favorite mm-hmm. yeah sounds very good <laughs> <laughs> all right so let's do the two by two. yeah great so today the topics that we have to talk about are graphs um gas gossip guns and goodness um so the first item is graphs how much do you think you know about graphs Venkat? Okay, so we talked about this um, with a reference to uh, Wolfram's article on you know hypergraphs for fundamental physics. So I know very little about hypergraphs in the sense the essay talked about, but basic graph theory I have a fair amount, like grad level understanding. I've used graph, uh, graph theory algorithms in my research and stuff. So I would say for basic graph stuff, I would put myself, uh, I don't know, above the center line at least. What about you? Um, I'd probably put myself at like a 0.1, so a little bit above zero, but I haven't, probably haven't done as much algorithmic stuff as you have, oddly enough. I mean. All right. So let's actually start annotating these. Oh, great. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, I was like, but Venkat, don't you, how would you, well, we can get into that later. That's cool. Okay. Um, uh, the next one is gas. Gas. All right. Um, so the oil industry, basically, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I've read, uh, what's his name? Daniel Yergin's book um, on the oil industry. I forget what it's called now. But um, he has a huge fat book. It's the, why am I blanking on this? But okay. Uh, based on that and the fact that I've driven and um, bought gas, I will put myself again <laughs> just... Uh, Slightly above the x-axis here. What about you? Mm, I think I know. I think I know more about the oil industry than most people, but I don't think I'm an expert at it. Um, I think most of the stuff I know is like anecdotal and like one degree removed, just because I have family that works in the oil industry. Um, I've been really been looking forward to reading this book, though, Oil One Hundred One, um, that talks more oil about one. Yeah, it talks more about the the market for energy, the energy market perspective. But so I, right. yeah, I'd put myself like, yeah, that looks good. All right, I'll put you a little bit um, to the right because I think you know more than me. All right, so that's gas. All right, what's next? Um, gossip. Gossip. Well, we are both on Twitter. I think we should both call ourselves experts on that. <laughs> Great. Sounds good. Uh, though, yeah. I don't know. I'm not actually that much of a gossip. What about you? I, I, I'm, very, I'm very much a gossip. All right. All right. So again, I'll give you a higher rating than me. <laughs> uh, that's very yeah. generous of you. I appreciate that. Um, uh, okay, uh, the next topic is guns. Um, guns. I think I know, a, I know some things about guns, but I probably, I'm not the sort of person, if you showed me a picture of a gun, I could tell you what kind of gun it is. Um, but I'm familiar with guns. I fired a, I fired a gun before. Have you fired a gun okay. before, Venkat? Mm, only in like an air pistol or air gun, like the kind you use in a fair to shoot at balloons. So no, so I'll, I'll go with no. Okay. I haven't ever fired a gun. But I think um, just as sort of a, being broadly interested in military technology and having worked on like military research and stuff. So from mm. this, this is going to sound stupid, but from a theoretical perspective, I think uh, I understand like the physics of guns a little bit. So that's about it. But again, this I'm going to put myself below the X axis line. But I think since you fired a gun, you get to go on the right side. And cool. Is this, does this look good for you? That's great. All right. Um, and then the last, the last topic we have, at least on our list, is uh, goodness. Goodness. 
I think we have to balance out our evilness discussion we had on E. Okay. Um, uh, what do I know about goodness? I don't know. I'm going to put myself on the below the line side negative column. I don't think I know a lot. <laughs> I don't think I'm very... All right. So we're both going to be bullshitting about goodness. I don't think <laughs> of us is a particularly good person. <laughs> this is very much a Scorpio chat. Welcome to All Scorpio right. chat. None of us are good. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's well, our two by two of expertise yeah. for today's um, conversation. Great. Should we start talking about graphs then? All right, let's do it. Um, so the thing I was going to mention is that, well, the, okay, so I wanted to talk about the graph theory stuff that Wolfram came out with. I can't believe it was just last week. It feels like a long time ago, um, but it was just, I think last Wednesday, right, was when he published like the blog post and put out all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was really, I, I tweeted that it was like the most personally gratifying thing I think I'll ever read um, in terms of so at refactor camp last year i gave a presentation on my thoughts about the multiverse and kind of just trying to like highlight what the um nature like so something i've been interested in for a while now is like basically and i think we talked about this a bit when we talked about david deutsch and d um david deutsch kind of wrote this book about how reality is multiversal there are many worlds. Um, there's like a many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. And so um, at Refactor Camp last year, I talked about how, like, what kinds of things that tells us about reality, assuming that the world is multi-universal or multi-worlds. Um, and a lot of the multi-worlds, like, stuff has to do with, like, entanglement level of quantum mechanics. Um, so when Wolfram came out with this really amazing kind of new project um and maybe it would be would it be useful for me to just kind of like spend some time talking through like what exactly Wolfram did because uh yeah I think a quick summary would look like uh, have you like followed Wolfram's work through his career or um, no I just read his blog post okay all right then maybe I should do the um, short summary because I think I have a, I might have a little bit more history there so um, yeah. Wolfram is interesting. Um, he was kind of like a child prodigy kind of um, guy in the 60s and 70s. I think he got his PhD from Caltech or something at like age 20 or something, very young. And he started out in like traditional, you know, uh, particle physics and stuff. And at some point, um, he kind of like took a weird uh, side fork in the road for a physicist which is he got really interested in cellular automata, the kind of stuff, oh, we should mention that John Conway, the guy who came up with the game of life, the 2D cellular automata, he died of um, COVID, I think last week. So it's kind of appropriate yeah. to be discussing this. But I, Wolfram's, I think, big contribution in that phase of his career, he did like some good traditional physics work, but the big thing he did, I think, was taking the two-dimensional cellular automata that had been studied until then. So John won um, Neumann's... Uh, 2D automata, John Conway's Game of Life, all of them are 2D grids. And he made it 1D. And I think that was a very interesting move because you would think that going down one dimension would make it like a less rich thing, but it turned out to be super rich. And he also invented Mathematica somewhere along the way. And I've used a Mathematica a little bit, not as much as I've used MATLAB, but Mathematica is kind of like, if you get your mind wrapped around it, it's like amazing software. And so, yeah, he did... Um, an early book on cellular automata that I bought when I was early in grad school. Then he sort of disappeared for a decade after like Mathematica became a successful product and sort of went off and did his own thing. And one fine day he emerged with this huge fat book called a new kind of science. So it was this like three inch fat book. And in which he, he made this kind of like cry wolf claim of having solved all of physics and sort of the rest of the future of physics was kind of like just a footnote to what he had done. And mm -hmm. people were kind of like really bemused by the uh, a new kind of science. And as it happened, I was in grad school at the time and he came to the University of Michigan and did a talk when he was doing the book tour around a new kind of science. And it was the weirdest talk I've ever been to. Like he's clearly like a super genius, super smart guy, but he's also like completely in his own world and has like no clue how he's being perceived. And he came across as like, 
completely tone deaf and arrogant. And he was like, oh yeah, there's some low hanging fruit here and you can sort of solve, solve super string theory with that low hanging fruit. And then we'll go on and we'll, we'll fix the world or universe kind of thing. And it was like, everybody was going, huh, what the hell? And in general, the reaction to that book was not good. And he was accused, I think, of like um, not sharing credit enough. So for those who followed that work, in 1D uh, automata, you can exhaustively enumerate all the possible automata. And he basically did a very brute force exploration of everything 1D automata could do. And it turned out that most of the rules did very boring things, except for a couple of them, which turned out to be Turing complete. So rule 110 was one of them. And I think rule 37 was another, if I remember correctly. But the one of his assistants was the one who actually proved NP or Turing completeness of rule 110. And there was a little bit of like, um, so we're getting into gossip now, but there was a little bit of like tension about him not giving enough credit to the guy who actually figured out that rule 110 was um, uh, Turing uh, uh, complete. So that was then, then he went into sort of hiding again and then came out with another great product, which was Wolfram Alpha, which I think uh, was as revolutionary as Mathematica. And now he's come out with this new theory of physics, which as far as I can tell, takes the same cellular automata approach, but the basic unit, instead of being like a pixel, like um, binary on off pixel, it's a hypergraph, right? And I read the same blog post mm -hmm. as you, but I think this is a good point for you to take over and explain the blog post to us. Yeah. So what's really cool about, at least like what I found really interesting about his approach is that um, it's a, it's almost like a very like, computational approach to, um, how do you explain that? Right. So he basically took this idea of like, what if the world is made of like cellular automatas, right? But that work in like, and dimensional spaces. So, um, so his first project, it sounds like we were talking about was one dimension. Now he said, okay, that's any, it's infinite dimensions or like, you know, however many dimensions. Um, and then let's explore what kinds of um, structures we get just by brute force searching. So he's still doing the same thing with brute force search stuff, as far as I can tell um, of like rules and relations and, um, a couple of, he added a couple of, um, so there's a couple of interesting things about that. One he's taken, so he's taken two fairly definitive stands, I think, about, about how he's building the physical universe. Um, one is that it's discrete, which means that there are, um, like, at some level, like, building blocks, right? It's not like a continuous object. He's decided that the, the version of the universe that he's going to represent is, has discrete units and that, you know, each of those units has like rules that interact with each other. Um, so that's like, that's interesting from a, a physical science perspective. Um, and then the other thing that he made, I think, I actually don't know. I don't know a whole lot about exactly like how physics stuff works. I would rate myself quite low on the, um, actual physics, but he also made a, um, he also made a decision that all of his models would be, um, yeah, that's the blog post. Um, he made a decision that all of the, um, what do you call it? Uh, everything would be time bounded, right? So basically there'll be rounds, right? And every round the equations are up, would update. So the automata has like an epoch, so to speak, and every epoch a move happens. Um, which is interesting. So he used these two, basically like two, these are like kind of the fundamental basic steps of the model that he built. Like one, it's discrete automata and two, there'll be epochs and there will be rule. There's like a rule set that we're exploring and um, the application of the rule set will then, so then he basically used computers to build these hypergraphs. Um, they're called hypergraphs. Like, a, like what is a hypergraph? A hypergraph is, I believe, a graph that just occurs in n dimensions, right? So there's like, uh, the yeah, way I understood it is a, a hypergraph is a graph where an edge can con uh, connect more than two vertices. So it, like if we're in a regular graph, an edge connects two nodes, so it's a line. In a mm -hmm. hypergraph, it can connect like three nodes, so it can be like a triangular sheet connecting three things. That's the uh, understanding I got, right? I see. Okay. Sure. Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. You tell me. That sounds great. Okay. Um, but this is basically like graphs in, so it's not it's not like one dimensional. It's not two dimensional. It's not, I don't think it's just three dimensional. I think it goes to like a lot of dimensions. Um, yeah. And so there's, we're showing some pictures of what these graphs look like. Um, and so basically it's like the idea is okay, given, so then, you know, when you're creating these graph structures, 
Um, it's like, what are the different, so it's a lot like game of life, right? Like I think Conway's game of life is actually a great analogy to the kind of project that Wolfram has done. Um, you know, in game of life, you come up, so there's like, so some of the differences, I guess maybe we can compare contrast, like the approach that Wolfram took and game of life, um, in Game of Life, the set of rules about how um, every epoch, what gets colored in and what gets deleted is set. So that doesn't change. So the rule set is known. And the other thing is that it's, well, it's two-dimensional. So it has a known rule set and it's two-dimensional. But the, the general idea is the same. You, um, you try different starting conditions and then you run it and you see what happens, right? And there's some initial starting conditions in Game of Life, like I, I, you know, they live forever. They become these like self-replicating like objects that just like keep going forever. And um, people have like cataloged all the different starting conditions that you can start with and like the the images that they create. Um, I think there's been a lot of research projects around different starting conditions in Conway's game of life. Um, but so interesting things happen though when you say, okay, uh, one, the rule set is not fixed. We're going to explore the set of rules. And then two, um, we're going to, like, so, and, you know, so you're exploring the set of rules, you're exploring the different starting, like, conditions, or, like, however you're setting up the, mo the, mo the molecules isn't the right thing. I don't know. The little bits of whatever that you're using. I don't know what term he uses, but, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what the term he uses is, but I guess we could call it, like, the generator or seed. It's like a random number generator type yeah, seed, right? It's so a seed. if it's this graph that I have on the screen, that's the one that he applies the recursion to, and then it creates bigger pictures that look kind of like this. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. So he's, I mean, it, the, it's a very large, so like, I feel like kind of what I'm trying to get at with this, like, explanation is that the, um, the space that you can explore as to what graphs you build are quite large, right? Because yep. the initial starting conditions, there's, like, I don't know if there's an infinite number of them, but there's a lot of different ways of different starting conditions that you can start with. And then the rule set that you can apply is quite large also, I would imagine. Um, so he's, he's exploring this to see what kinds of graphs that he gets. And that is mostly what he has published. Um, but yeah, the I think dimension the things that question has, is uh, interesting. Like um, there's 1D automata, 2D automata, but those are like spaces that have grids on them. Whereas when you're talking of graphs, it's actually not easy to talk about the dimensionality of a graph. You can talk about the number of um, vertices and edges it has, or in this case, hyper edges, but that's not quite the same thing as the dimension of a space. But um, yeah, so in general, this is, I think, a lot more, uh, I don't know, expressive. Like it's not a particular region of space or something. It's like this object, and then you apply a recursion to it. So in that sense, it's a little bit like fractals, but it's not in, embedded in a particular space. So yeah, it's a very powerful framework. The part I don't think I truly kind of got is how he maps this to physics. Like what does it mean to say that one of these models reproduces Newtonian physics or superstring theory? I didn't get that part. Yeah, okay. So uh, so I think the, the part that, hmm, I'm not, I might not do a great job explaining this, but the general idea, I think, is that he's saying that the he you can construct that space is constructed of graphs of particles. So like, so there's actually, so like the you know when it, you talk about like space time curvature and whatnot, um, like so the the curve. So I, I wish I knew Einstein better than I do. I don't really <laughs> know much about Einstein. I know a few things that I've read. I think I just bought one of his books. It's like Einstein wrote a pop sci book that I ordered recently. So I'll know about more about Einstein in the future. But um, the general idea was that like relativity and such depend on this concept of space time, so which is to say that the fabric, so that like, I believe a few things about that are like, the general idea is that space and time create a fabric and that that fabric has curves in it. And because of the curves, that changes the rate at which you or different objects experience phenomena that happen in the curve of space and time as a fabric. Um, and Wolfram has said it's, it is, the fabric is made up of this graph that he has created. Um, and so we can see the connections between, we can see the fabric as this graph that is created um, and that as things, and then so he kind of has this like interesting thing about like initial starting conditions and 
where you end up and the branches that you go through or all the possible combinations. So this is, this is where I get really excited about it because my whole thing, at least at Refactor Camp last year, was about um, this like many worlds kind of branching. Like what does it mean that reality branches, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Wolfram, I think, gives a really interesting and clear answer about how that works in like a very physical and practical sense, um, which I thought was really cool. Like basically he has like a great picture of how you start with like string editing. Um, okay. So like you start with a string like A, B, B, A, B, B, and then you apply a rule to that such that every B gets replaced with an A. Like two Bs becomes an A and an A and a B becomes like a, another B, B, and you can walk through the string and apply the rule. And there's, a bunch of different possible paths that you can take depending on what part of the string you apply the rule to at what order. Um, so he draws out the graph of all the different possibilities of ways that you could end, like, get to the answer and then kind of showing how at the end they all come together. Um, but I think his like idea there is that there's a bunch of different ways that information or particles can flow through space along this like graph of time and space that we exist in. Um, but they tend to all end up at the same place, no matter which path they take to get there. Um, which I think is really interesting. Okay, um, so there's interesting relationships there. Uh, uh, so this actually sounds like in some sense as a conceptual continuation of what he did with a new kind of science, because he was saying the same sorts of things that this is like uh, 20 years ago that I heard him speak, but he was saying the same sorts of things. And it sounds like the way this is set up, depending on how you set up the initial rules, it'll, it'll create like a wind up toy kind of system or universe that sort of evolves in a particular way and might end up yep. in like the same phase space uh, end state as anything else. So there's like an entropy kind of angle to this. Um, and mm -hmm. time is basically the rate of iteration. He actually didn't yes. have a good answer. Somebody asked him that question in that talk, I remember, about how time works here. Because time in a digital sort of simulation type universe is just the number of times you apply the recursion and the state changes in a measurable yes. way, right? Yes, and 100%. Uh, yes. Yeah. I don't know, but this is like... I like, I guess I had a blog post I wrote like six months ago that basically was like saying the same thing. I don't think anyone read this blog post. It's fine. And like, but like, it, like, it's just, like, this like to me, like, this just makes sense. Like, based on the stuff I've read from like David Deutsch and like just thinking about how, from like knowing how state works in computers and how, anyways, yeah. So, yes, it's like, it's like a graph and rules get applied. And as the rules get applied, that is time moving forward. So, so um, I think it wouldn't be fair if we let this go without sort of what the alternate critical view might look like. So just to play devil's advocate here, uh, mm, I've been yeah. reading this book um, by, uh, it's part of the Discworld, um, Science of Discworld series. So Discworld is Terry Pratchett's um, fantasy science fiction universe. And the series within that called the Science of Discworld, which is interesting, which is in the Discworld mythos, Earth and our universe are actually created by the Discworld wizards and so forth. And we are actually a subset of their universe. And they study science because their world is like, it's a flat world. It's riding on the back of a turtle that stands on elephants. So it's like every fantasy trope, it's played for laughs in Discworld. But Round World runs, with, they call Earth Round World. That runs on um, regular physics. So the wizards try going around, understanding physics-based human universe in terms of their magical concepts. So it's like the opposite of what we try to do when we do fantasy. But this uh, part three is I think called Darwin's Watch or something. And mm. it gets a lot into multiverses and things like that from the point of view of evolution because the plot is built around the wizards discovering that in the version of history that they're tracking, Darwin never writes his um, evolution book and they think, um, that's bad because the universe doesn't continue in the right way for their experiments. So the whole plot is built around the wizards going into round world and trying Fine. to like make sure Darwin in fact does end up writing uh, the book. So they go around trying to chop off all possible ways he does not get on the beagle where mm -hmm. he stopped from going to the Galapagos, right? And so mm -hmm. they, that's the sort of fictional subplot. And then the B plot is they have like this commentary on the science of that, like what does it mean and so forth. 
and there's a um, there's a point here but the point they make is in physics you have to make a distinction between things that are sort of mathematically convenient to sort of describe what's going on versus <laughs> actually true in a physical sense. So the basic ap application to many worlds is, like if you take something like um, uh, Feynman's uh, least action principle and the sum over integrals kind of thing, you, there's two ways about it. One is to say, oh, there are universes where light actually travels all those ways and then it all interferes and ends up with the one path that we actually see. Or you can say yeah. that sum over histories is just convenient mathematical representation and really light only takes one path. And you can apply that kind of thinking to everything. So uh, I like to be a little cautious about um, this stuff and walk from- But how do, you know which, how do you know which path it's gonna take unless you look at all of them? So, so that's the math. The math lets you look at all the paths, but uh, again, uh, actually a simpler example might um, help you like- um, in But the more math doesn't work out if you don't look at all the paths. No, you can look at all the paths, but there's a difference between looking at the paths as a mathematical sort of procedure versus mm -hmm. considering the paths to be representative of real um, things that happened either in this universe or in a parallel universe, right? Um, mm -hmm. So like uh, in a simpler example is high school physics level, you might have, um, I don't know if you saw this, but I was taught a trick called virtual work. So when you want to like analyze the equilibrium of a bunch of blocks and things like leaning against each other and ask, is it stable? Is this um, pile of stuff going to fall apart. What you do is you apply a um, technique called virtual work, which is you look at small perturbations of the system state in a lot of different directions and ask, all right, how does the system behave under that small perturbation? And that does sort of an angle you could take where that's a computational procedure that just tests the perturbation stability of that equilibrium. But another way you could think of it is that uh, this is actually some sort of cancellation of all the perturbation universes and those cancel out. So I'm, um, I, I don't know, I want to believe in multiverse type stuff, but it's like, I, I'm, I, and I think Wolfram actually genuinely makes this mistake. Like somebody was criticizing him about uh, for this earlier on as well. Like he never quite clarifies what the philosophical relationship is between a, a computer simulation that recovers certain sort of features of what the real universe looks like versus the real universe itself. And a lot of, uh, and it might be worth mentioning a few other of these digital physics people. Like I think, have you read Seth Lloyd's book, uh, The Programmable Universe? So that's uh, worthwhile as well. He's, a, he's more of a traditional yeah. physicist who uh, tried to think of, all right, could the whole world be basically a computer program? So I think it's, at the very least, it's a very interesting and illuminating thought experiment that in, has an uncanny resemblance to the way the world actually seems to be. But I'm, I, I personally stop short of saying, oh, the world is in fact a program running on some notional computer. So I, I, I'm not willing to go there. Mm. Are you willing to go I there? Think, I, think Wolfram, I think Wolfram nailed it. I am like, I'm convinced that Wolfram has nailed it. And it is like, I okay. think this probably comes okay, from- Okay, Wolfram, but do you believe that, that the universe is a- um, program running on a computer of some sort in some loose sense? Uh, yeah, 100%. Okay, so you believe in a computational view of the universe. I'm not sure I do. Uh, and there are objects like, I think people have made objections based on like Bell's paradox and a couple of other things. But uh, uh, let me say I'm agnostic about it. I'm not either an atheist or a theist on computational physics. I'm an agnostic. It could be true, it might not be true. Mm, I see. Oh, I love that. I like that lens of looking at through it through religion, though. That's really. I like that. I'm like. I'm gonna keep that one. Um, uh, that might be a good segue to your next topic, right? Godheads and giants. That is a great segue into the next topic. Um, so this is something I just kind of have been thinking about. Why have I been thinking about it? I'm not sure why I've been thinking about it, but I've kind of been thinking about like if I had a patron saint. Um, which would be like, so if you like, so if you had to like look at the Pantheon, um, I tend to go back to the ancient Greeks just because um, that's like the first one I really got into as like a kid, like in grade school, I was like obsessed with like ancient Greek mythology, which is fascinating. Um, uh, but like the thing I realized about it is that I never really self-identified with any of the Pantheon, which is like, I don't think that that's necessarily weird, but I do think it's like kind of notable because to some extent, aren't they like 
and it's like um to some extent isn't that supposed to be isn't that supposed to encompass and I guess this like kind of gets back to astrology like the thing I like about astrology is I feel like it does a good job of reifying or creating like the archetypes of 12 different types of humans and you as a human can find yourself in some combination of those 12 like they're in I I might be wrong. Someone could prove me wrong. But I like to think that astrology is like all encompassing that way. And that like through the literature and lore and layers that they've added to it, like every expression of humanity can be found somewhere within that system. Um, So I think Mm -hmm. I was like looking back at like the Greek pantheon and trying to come up with like, okay, what's my like patron saint of Greek mythology. So it's interesting that you're using the term patron saint and the term identification because the idea of a patron saint is uh, later Christian mythology and um, the Greek pantheon as, as I understand it is not the same as like you and I identify as Scorpios as archetypes that are meant to describe humans. Whereas if you look at the Greek gods, I don't think they're meant to describe Mm. things that are ideals of which humans are approximations. Are they like, okay, maybe there's a little bit like the one I have always found interesting is um, Wait, is this Greek or Roman? Apollo versus uh, Dion, Dionysus? That's Greek. That's, That's Greek. Greek, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the Apollonian versus the Dionysian um, mm-hmm. way of life, I would call myself uh, um, Dionys- Dionysian by temperament and Apollonian by training or something like that. So in that sense, I identify, but it's, it doesn't feel quite right to call it archetypes. Like Apollo is like the ruler of... Um, the gods or something. So that's that's not he's, an aspect that I... Apollo, no, he's not the ruler. Oh, wait, that's Zeus. I, feel like Apollo, I keep getting confused. Zeus is the god, right? Zeus is the god. He's married okay, to Hera. What's Apollo again? Apollo is his son, I okay. believe. And he has a twin sister, I thought was... His twin sister is Artemis, I thought. Um, so who do you identify with most? Who's your quote-unquote patron saint slash... Idol? Right. So this is the thing. I... Okay, so I've been thinking this a lot and like... I don't think it's an exact thing, but I think that like my patron saint would be from the um, the Norse mythology, Loki, who's okay. kind of like this trickster. Um, and then I was looking back at the Greek stuff to try and find a similar analog. Um, and the one I ended up on is like not mentioned in any of like normal lore. It's one called NYX, Nyx, okay. who's like, anyways, it's kind of in like the the trickster darkness like corner of Greek mythology that you don't hear about a whole lot. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I think I've seen the name Nyx mentioned, but I never actually bothered to look. Um, is it a male or female god? Is it a she or a he? I don't know. I think it's oh, okay. a guy. Okay. <laughs> this is Lisa's ability to remember things like no, but like, anyway, I, Go okay, so um, you identify with Nick's trickster god. Sort of, yeah. But sort of like dark humor. It's like dark humor side of stuff. Um, it's darker than darker <laughs> and less. Hey. So okay. going down from godheads to giants, uh, you put godheads and giants in, the, in one topic, right? So what's the I difference? Did, yeah. Oh, so I think like, so I think like the idea then from like going from like godheads of like like so it's like okay a godhead is identifying yourself within like a a framework or like a of mythology so like the greek pantheon or okay. sort of astrology sort of that's yeah, a little right. less or like, Norse mythology okay yeah or Norse mythology um whereas like i feel like giants is kind of like are there people in the public realm that you like have an affinity with that would almost be like your patron saint or whatever of um the modern pantheon so that is like let's say like patron saints then would it be david deutsch and now stephen waltram i don't think so i don't <laughs> like i mean i definitely like i definitely think they're giants and uh hope that we ever if we ever hung out we'd be besties but like i don't think like yeah i don't know i and don't do really have any giants like you have the idea in your head but do you have any specific named people you would cast as your personal giants I mean, VGR, of course, is one. Um, like, <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> um, but I just, cause I think I like the way that you play with topics on, I like the way that you play with topics on Twitter is, um, I think like kind of the, I'm a giant on Twitter. That's, uh, that sounds like a Lilliput joke of some sort. Oh, Lilliput, Gulliver Star <laughs> Travels. There we go. That's another G topic. Gulliver, have another, you read Gulliver's yeah. Travels? I have not read Gulliver's oh, Travels. Oh, well, uh, it's like, I think probably the best of the, I don't know, absurdist fantasies of the 19th century. No, it's more political satire than anything. And uh, mm. you know the basic premise of Gulliver though, right? Lilliput and Rob Nag. Have you heard? Oh, okay. So uh, let me introduce you to a classic of English literature. So Gulliver is this traveler <laughs> kind of guy who goes off and gets shipwrecked or something on some strange land. And that land is um, uh, Lilliput. So Lilliput is a land where everybody's tiny. And he is a giant among those tiny people. And he has adventures there. Then he gets back home and then he goes on another adventure. And that's the land called Brobdignag. And that's everybody's a giant and he feels very little. Mm -hmm. Right? So it's a giants and little people kind of... Um, mythology. Uh, and it was meant to be a satire on, I think, English politics of that era. Uh, but it's, um, it, it's, I'm surprised you haven't heard of it. Like, um, actually, there's a part of it that's ended up in um, computer science uh, lingo. So you know what uh, little Indian and big Indian are, right? It, it, yes. Like, uh, okay. That comes from Gulliver's travel. No. Wait. Yes, because uh, at least I'm pretty sure it does because in one of the little subplots in Gulliver's Travels is that there's two tribes on the island that fight over which is the right end of the egg to crack. So there's a tribe that believes you should crack the egg on the little end and a tribe that uh, believes you should crack the egg on the big end. And I believe that's the origin of the big end, little end uh, thing in computer science. You're not aware of this? <laughs> okay. well, no. I think you learned today then. Uh, oh, but that's incredible. Okay. Uh, but, but back on the Giants topic, I don't know, I have a very sort of, uh, I guess I would classify myself as a conceptual giant killer because I, I am, maybe it's very small minded of me, but I cannot bring myself to put anybody up on a pedestal as um, in sort of a giant role. Like there's an aspect of this that's, um, you've heard the term Straussian, right? Tyler Cohen uses it a lot. Mm -mm. So, so Straussian uh, is, uh, yeah, basically conservative uh, political philosophy is built on Strauss's work, but Straussian as an adjective uh, refers to a particular sort of intellectual culture built around the idea that there are these uh, I don't know, exceptional giant like people whose works are truly worth studying. And then the second tier mm -hmm. of like scholarly people who study their works. So it, it might be, for example, uh, Plato might be one of them. And then there's like hundreds of years of people studying Plato, right? So the Straussian yeah. approach to at least thinking about society and like human condition stuff is uh, to believe that there are exceptional giant like people who have more insight into the nature of humanity than the rest of us. And whatever they do, they come up with these like, I don't know, big fat books, like maybe Stephen Wolfram's book or something. So that's the core text. So, so they become Bible like um, artifacts and then cultures grow up around like interpreting and understanding what this great person did. And I found, I've always found that approach to knowledge, putting somebody up on a pedestal as a giant and their works as like esoteric. So esoteric, exoteric, that distinction comes from here, but putting their works up on a pedestal and everybody else is just minions having to like worshipfully study their work. That pisses me off. Maybe I'm very small minded about this, but I'm, I'm anti Straussian. So you could say I'm anti giant. <laughs> I don't think in those terms. Have you ever written a book review, Venkat? I've written a couple. Uh, usually I only write review summaries of books I actually enjoy and kind of want to summarize for other people. But proper reviews, uh, I've only done a couple and they're all kind of negative. Mm -hmm. like, so I stopped doing them because mm -hmm. it's, it's just not a fun thing to do. One of them was actually on Seth Godin's book, uh, Tribes. So I thought it was an awful book and wrote a review saying it was an awful book. And the other one I think I did a negative review of was Blue Ocean Strategy. So again- Oh, I've heard about that. Sorry. I mean, I've, yeah, yeah but, I went to business school. Oh God. So I hated both of them, wrote negative reviews, and then I decided I was done writing negative reviews. It's like, if I like the book, I might summarize it so others can benefit from it, but I won't ever review books. I might summarize books I like, but not touch books I don't like. So that's where I am on that. I think disengagement. I was going to say, like, the reason, 
right? Disengagement from, I don't know, review pettiness. Well, the reason I bring it up is I feel like a lot of the, um, I feel like the one way that the, that like secondary market of ideas that you're talking about tends to surface itself is through like the idea, like through the review and critique like market. It sounds like you exited from that as soon as possible and in like flame, flame, flame out fashion. Um, like, you know, you wrote some no, bad I, I wouldn't call it flame out. I mean, I just don't see it as super productive. I don't see book reviewing as a properly productive activity. Like proper scholarly sort of analysis of like major books is sometimes useful. Um, But then you have to like take a biographer's view to it where you're neither too respectful nor out to like, you know, do... um, a proper hatchet job. You kind of have to understand the book in its context, set the author aside and sort of understand where it came from. That's useful mm-hmm. as a scholarly activity. That's what I don't know, Shakespeare scholars do. It sort mm-hmm. of overlaps with what I was just calling Straussian um, thinking where uh, I think Strauss- Straussianism keels over into, I don't know, worshipful reverence and uncritical admiration for the source material. Whereas mm-hmm. regular academic scholarship is more like, all right, you're not a god, you're not, um, by default, a terrible person either. You're just another person who's done something. Let's understand what you did. So I, I, I like that kind of like level playing field approach to understanding. Other and you, you can acknowledge that people are geniuses or way smarter than you or whatever, but uh, you still have to approach them as humans, not as like beyond critique. I see. So it's, so it's not so much the it's not so much the fact that there arrives discourse in which great works are discussed, but rather the tonal quality of consideration of the works. Yeah. So the, so the posture you bring to the reading, so that's really where I have a problem with a lot of like review style discourses. And, um, all right. So that's my quick take on Giants. What are your closing uh, thoughts on Giants? Um, I think I agree with you in terms of, I 100% agree with you in terms of the reverence-ness. Um, I think one way that I sort of personally have combat that is I tend to like pretend like I'm good friends with all of the big writers that I read and appreciate. Like Hannah and I are good, you know, Hannah, my buddy Hannah, who's written like The Human Condition and some great works on totalitarianism and um, I call myself a Janesian in reference to Jane Jacobs, which that actually has two, there's two good reasons for that. One, I think Jacob, Jacobianism is like overloaded. Um, but also like, yeah, Jane Jacobs, best buds. Great. Um, yeah. So I think that's kind of the way that I personally combat that is because it, it does kind of take them down from like this, um, a pedestal-esque thing and make it at least in my mind more like oh yeah just it, it's easier to kind of feel like a peer of the thinkers that way um yeah it's a difficult question and it's sort of fraught with um, identity like we are all peers in certain senses of just simply being human and having certain and reciprocity relationships as simple humans but that doesn't mean you cannot acknowledge actual differences, including differences in competence and capability and genius or whatever it is. But it's like all those things are almost like secondary. The basic, um, uh, the basic basis of reciprocity and uh, relating to anybody, whether you're reading them or uh, writing about them or talking to them, I think has to be this... Uh, sense of mutual recognition of human, which is one of um, Hannah Arendt's um, uh, big themes. And that's, of course, always easy to do with the living people you actually know, because then there's actual opportunities for interaction where you recognize each other as human. When you do that with somebody who's basically dead and gone, it's much harder, right? And I think your way is um, kind of interesting. Uh, both are dead, right? Hannah Arendt died in the 60s. And when did Jane Jacobs die? She, she's dead. Jane right? Jacobs died in, I want to say, 2006. Oh, okay. So both are dead. So, yes, they're both dead. They can't. Yeah. <laughs> they're both dead. Fine. Okay. So they can't uh, recognize you. Like you can sort of 
pretend they're your friend and you can make your Twitter handle James and RNTN or whatever, but they can't literally <laughs> be your friends because they're not around anymore. But I think you can sort of try and achieve that sense of um, reciprocity of recognition somehow, even though you might not be comparable to them in a lot of ways, you will be comparable in that mutual recognition sense, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think this kind of goes back to like, like, if you think about like friendships or like kind of what I was trying to get at with like the Godhead idea of like self-identification, right? Like it's the whole thing with like at least the, the patron saint, whatever. Um, and maybe it's more of like aspirational or whatever, but you kind of like pick a tribe. But it like some part of that involves like an amount of seeing yourself there, right? And I think that some friendships, maybe not, I'm not like an expert on friendships, but I think that some amount of human relationships, like a lot of what you get out of it tends to be the foil that that provides for yourself. Like what you, what that relationship helps you see and appreciate in yourself tends to be what you like about a relationship. So I think that a lot of the reciprocity or whatever that goes through with like, oh yeah, like Jane and I were best friends is like the parts of her work that I like, not only say see myself in, but like, like just, it just like agrees with me if that makes sense. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, we should have talked about friendship in the F one. So we can do that when we come back around to F. Uh, but maybe we can um, do a quick question on friendship. Are you a super friendly person? Do you have lots of friends? I don't know, Venkat. I have no idea. Because I'm not. I mean, I have lots of sort of... Um, I don't know, lots and lots of people in the acquaintance zone. And then there's being like a public uh, blogger means I have a lot of people in this weird reader zone, but I've never been a super friendly person. Like I think I last had a best friend in fifth grade. And since then I would say I've retained maybe one or two friends from college years, but otherwise I'm like, I'm generally like shallowly friendly with a lot of people, but I, I don't think I've had a deep friendship in like 30 years. So I don't know if that sounds sad or whatever. So he was it's checking all, in. Yeah, it's, it's not something I miss in my life. Like some people, for them, that would be a very traumatic condition to be in, like not have any truly deep friends. But for me, it's like, I kind of prefer it that way. So, uh, but do you have like any deep friends? <laughs> I mean, I don't know, man. I don't know. This is like, this is like the Scorpio part of me just being like, I don't, there's no closeness here. No, there's like a wall. Everyone stays on the other side of it. Like lots of friends, but they're just far away. It's great. I love them. I mean, I live in Texas. Most of my friends don't live anywhere near me. It's great. Um, <laughs> they don't live anywhere near you, you and that's great. For a lot of people, that would be the definition of trauma. Uh, and okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So <laughs> neither of us is very friendly. We are both classic Scorpios. And <laughs> at arm's length behind a wall. So that's good. All right. Uh, it is good. Um, so we have two things left. Up. Well, we have, I guess, three, but maybe we should. Um, we have gossip, guns, and goodness left. Um, right. Should we talk about guns really quickly and then maybe get into gossip? Yeah, let's talk guns. Yep. Okay, so um, I haven't really been following the gun news, but my understanding, there's, I think there's like two or three things that I want to like point out is why they're kind of in the national consciousness a lot lately, or maybe four. Okay, one is that I think gun sales went out the roof whenever the quarantine was announced. Um, mm -hmm. Two, um, gun store sales were considered essential services, so the gun stores did not close down when quarantine happened, which I thought was notable interesting like that's just interesting okay gun stores essential service yeah. that's a that's a political decision that's a mm -hmm. that's a value um and then three is that there have been no school shootings since quarantine started is my understanding the last month <laughs> um <laughs> top of the guns and then um Oh, the first thing is more of an anecdote that I wanted to tell that I thought was funny. So it sounds like a lot of people own guns. It's still possible to get a gun. Um, less guns are being used in schools, which I think most people would agree is like a positive outcome of there not being school. Um, uh, yeah. But uh, I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't own it. Personally, I don't own guns. I have friends that own guns. Um, my dad but you fired that. a gun, you said, right? I have fired a gun in a shooting range. Well, and then that time not in a shooting range. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so it is something I might want to do eventually. But it's like, 
I'm almost indifferent to guns in sort of the American political sense. Like if I ever had to actually learn for whatever reason, I guess I would learn and I would be mediocre at it. Like I am at most things. Uh, I wouldn't be a, you know, sharp, whatever, uh, sharpshooter or whatever, Marksman, but I don't like, think I would suck yeah. either. So I would be somewhere in the middle. Uh, and, and I don't have like strong feelings either way. But um, I did think about the school shootings going down in one sense. Like I've always thought that there's a fundamental conflict between the first amendment and the second amendment that people don't talk about much because the first uh, amendment is actually two things, not one thing, right? It's not just freedom of speech. It's freedom of speech and assembly, right? And assembly is the one Mm -hmm. thing that's being shut down now. Like you can, speech is still out there. Like if if you can tweet, you can do whatever. Nobody's stopping anybody from speaking, but free assembly has shut Mm -hmm. down. And if you think about the conflict, it's actually free assembly versus right to bear arms because Free assembly means people get together in large crowds and it sort of creates this mode of political action for pissed off people to do mass shootings. And it's kind of interesting that social distancing distancing kind of solves that and kind of makes the gun issue a lot less fraught. Like if you took mass shootings out of the equation, I think a lot fewer people would have problems with gun culture or gun rights at all. Like I wouldn't, for example. So that, that's something interesting to note. And if you had to give one up, like you can either have freedom of assembly or you can have freedom to bear arms, which would you pick would be an interesting question. And I, I might actually be okay with picking guns over freedom of assembly. Says the man with no friends. Okay. Like, sorry. <laughs> true, true. Uh, also because I, I hate packed crowds. I, I've been to one rock concert in my life. I occasionally have been to like live like more sedate kinds of concert venues, but I fundamentally don't like being in large crowds, whether it's for sports or music or anything. So it's basically no loss to me. And I think that's obviously disingenuous of me to sort of give up assembly since I don't use that right anyway. But for people whose lives depend on like being in the mosh pit at a rock concert or something, I I imagine it'll feel like the world is ending if you shut down free assembly. Well, that world definitely would be, yeah, or has. I mean, <laughs> like, yes, that's correct. Yes, that world is over. Um, uh, do you do a lot of that? Like, do you go to like packed parties and concert type things? Do you like going to those kinds of situations? No? I enjoy going to them when I go, but it's not something that I spend time seeking out. So usually if a friend is like, let's go to a concert, I'll be like, yeah, heck yes, let's go to a freaking concert. Um, but <laughs> I'm not like, so recently I've gotten more into a certain like, seeing people live um so i've like there's like a couple which i've never really done this before but there's a couple like performers that i'm kind of keeping an eye on but i'm not sure how i would go with i guess i have some friends here that i could convince to come with me but um yeah Yeah. so yes but not something i like like, it's not like central to your identity that you're a concert goer like i have friends who are like that (laughs) to the extent i have friends i have friends who are big on concert going acquaintances i right. guess yeah no they're more uh, somewhere they're more than acquaintances but they're not deep friends i would say good casual friends which is about as far as it goes i feel like this deep friends thing is a thing that scorpios do i used to struggle a lot in like middle school grade school with like exactly what it meant to have a best friend like i needed like i needed like like some kind of definition or like a sign or like it needed to be this like really intense intimate thing um i'm older now i like i have like some distance on that so yeah i feel like that's a very like you need like just intensity in a relationship that i don't think most people need would be my huh yeah yeah maybe they do um should we talk about gossip and goodness and then probably wrap up I think we have only time for one of those. So let's, uh, you pick. Okay. Let's talk about gossip. I want to hear what you have to say about gossip. Let's gossip about gossip. (laughs) Uh, Gossip is an interesting thing. It's like, it's like having your finger on the pulse of what's going on in say a subculture. So gossip is never a sort of an abstract activity, right? It's about specific named people, right? Like you Mm -hmm. and I, for example, are both, on the fringes of the group that calls itself uh, post-rationalists in San Francisco. Like, I think you're deeper into that subgroup than I am. I think because I'm older and my relationship 
to that communities more through my writing than in person. So it's like, it's, uh, I have more of a distanced view, but it's like, all right, the Twitter mm-hmm. crowd, we both hang out with a lot of them are from there. And a lot of the names I recognize on Twitter, even though some of them don't have their real names online. And a lot of what goes on in the, in the fun part of Twitter is kind of like indirectly gossip. Even if you're not saying specific things about specific people, just the way you're interacting with people reflects an understanding that's I think rooted in gossip, right? So that's kind of my mm-hmm. view of gossip. It's, it's almost like, okay, gossip is the sort of um, tacit knowledge of a community that allows you to sort of participate without looking weird or something or uh, how, okay. Where would you social put literacy inside uh, jokes? Oh, inside jokes. Huh. In the gossip, like, um, I think it's only inside jokes or gossip if they refer to a particular person. So if it's known that you can make fun of a particular person for a particular, I don't know, weakness or something that, that makes it part of gossip. But if just an inside joke that everybody in the community knows, I don't think that's gossip really. I'm trying to think of like a recent good example of an inside joke and I'm struggling, but I really feel like, cause like, so the thing that I feel like I saw, Sometimes on Twitter, you log on and you're like, what the hell is everyone talking about? What is this thing? And then you have to go like digging to figure out what the original like seed generator of all the memes about like thing going burr or whatever. Mm-hmm. Oh, like so like printer go burr is like kind of an inside joke. Um, yeah, it's. But that's not gossip. No, it's, it's well, go burr is a meme that admits several layers of analysis, right? Like if you just look at it, it's a joke about federal fiscal mm-hmm. measures. But then you look at the actual characters, it's the Wojak character from the NPC meme. And then you realize that the NPC meme is sort of an in-group concept in particular conversations. And then you relate that to other yeah, memes like, know um, you know, yeah. So that way you can sort of, the layers of analysis might get you into particular conversational contexts. But I, I, I don't think memes by themselves uh, are part of gossip like gossip okay but like proper... so... yeah mm. gossip needs names yeah. let me put it that way gossip needs proper names of actual living people otherwise it's not gossip okay so like the whole i was gonna try and be like so this i mean i i, I don't know anything about Wojak. jack i feel like you saying it right now is maybe the second time i've heard it so i like have a little bit of context like i've seen it somewhere before it's like mm-hmm. i'm very out of some mean sphere it's fine um but the like but like, is Wojak not a character that you gossip about? No, because he's fictional. Wojak not is real. A, yeah, it's not real. It's a cartoon that somebody made up on Reddit. And then he became a representative of a particular kind of um, ineffectual, weak, non-agency character, right? Um, okay. Uh, but yeah. Okay. The, there's so, a spectrum so that's there. like gossip about him. There's a spectrum there, though. Okay. Like, I think the Wojak meme is kind of adjacent to the Chad versus Virgin meme. You've seen that, right? And the Virgin meme there, it maps very closely to the incel uh, subculture. So as an archetype, it maps to everybody who identifies as an incel on the Reddit forum or something. And then you get deeper and deeper. You can see people actually apply that meme template to specific named people. Like you might say, oh, Obama is an NPC or something, or even somebody less famous. And then that becomes that. gossip, right? Then it becomes gossip, right? Yeah, mm. but the, but so but so it feels like there's we're getting at some like very kind of interesting relationship here between like this like what I was calling like inside jokes, which is basically like meme culture, and the ability to generate gossip, right? Because you can by you create the archetype or like the joke, right, and then you apply it to a person like Obama, and then all of a sudden like that's that's kind of gossip, right? But it's like gossip that yeah like, yeah cool because you're. That you're capturing intelligence about sort of the particular person. So to put it in a very aspy way, you're like mm. characterizing the API of that person. Like saying that somebody's an NPC means declaring certain methods you can use on that person. So I'm being very aspy here, but um, sort of less aspy way of putting it is it, it gives you a way to relate to them in a more sort of mutual recognition way. Uh, but, but let's actually try a little bit mm. of gossip um, right now. So for example, when I go on Twitter and I think about what's happening in the post rat crowd and I see tweets from that crowd going past, invariably mm-hmm. one of the mm-hmm. people I look out for is our mutual friend, uh, Sonia, because she's at sort of the center of that crowd. And if uh, Sonia is tweeting about it, I know that 
it's reached a certain level of critical mass in the discourse. And it's like, all right, this is now Sonia grade meme or something. So that's an example of how Sonia plays a particular role in the ecosystem we inhabit, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, and if I want, I don't know, to learn about something, I might ping her about that, right? But uh, yeah, so that's me gossiping about Sonia. Yeah, that is some gossip about Sonia. <laughs> I wanted to make a um, like, I wanted to make a small, interesting kind of aside going back to like the Greek gods um, and Apollo. Apollo mm -hmm. is, I would say, I think Apollo is Chad, and um, Artemis would be the Virgin. That's his sister. I'm pretty sure that in <laughs> Legend she is like the Virgin. Like literally, that was her thing. Is that she like she ran through the forest and was a huntress and like <laughs> basically a virgin, but she's female, so that's like. Oh yeah, I don't think the archetype applies to women, yeah, or at least not in a no, in an obvious way. Yeah, yeah but, it doesn't work there. Oh. But it's kind of funny that there's like there is that like paradigm, maybe not in exactly the same format as modern culture, but it's funny. I would actually argue that Apollo and Dionysius is um, is that like Dionysius is the Chad and Apollo would be the Virgin in that comparison. The Virgin. Yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe because I don't understand this meme well. It's, it's partly a matter of taste and partly a matter of who you want to insult, really. I mean, all these meme templates are, you always put the negative um, archetype on whoever you want to insult, right? Uh, so this is like, yeah, it's like the gossip get generation machine. Like, you can crank out as much gossip as you want just by, like, applying the template to different characters. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just endless. Yeah endless entertainment which is why i guess people never run out of things to say on twitter.com um yeah memes i think that, that's one of the functions it's not their only function but definitely one of the functions of memes is uh, yeah enabling gossip and i don't think i have anything else to say about gossip mm. i think like yeah so i like i haven't thought a whole lot about gossip i think that like the one so I think my like take on gossip would veer more into um, veer more into like fake news category um, than oh, yeah. reputational. And the only insight I actually got this from a friend, I think Yusuf Fractionist and I were talking at one point, and it about gossip weirdly enough. And the thing about I don't know exactly remember what our conversation was about, but um, the the insight that I had that I thought was really interesting is that gossip becomes like a form of reality. It's like a reality shaping mechanism, but the reality is like our, if you take the view that reality is like the understanding that a human has about the world, um, mm -hmm. gossip is a way of shaping and forming the way that we as like people see other parts of reality. Um, so gossip is kind of like oh. the form that which reality creation gets made about other characters in this like reality um, or maybe about like vaccines. You like gossip about how good or bad the vaccine ah, is. Got it. Got it. Um, I think you're bringing up an interesting point that um, I kind of like I had in my blind spot for a bit there. Uh, but, but that aspect of gossip would be the grape wine aspect, the reputational plus reality lensing kind of effect like take for example entering a new industry as somebody who's maybe looking for a career in that industry and you can mm -hmm. go to linkedin you can look at the profiles of like important people there you can look up biographies on company websites and that gives you one view of that industry another view is you go to somebody who's been a veteran in that industry for a long time and ask them all right who is actually important to know what is this famous person really like when you get to know him and then you get a very subjectively colored view like it's colored by their that person's experience in the industry maybe they're like frustrated maybe they're successful maybe they're failures whatever mm -hmm. their story in that world has been it's the lens but it gives you something deeper and more real like somebody might tell you oh yeah this person acts all compassionate in press releases and when on when being interviewed but when you actually get into a back room with him he's like the world's biggest asshole and screws people over constantly right so that's yeah. an example of like grapevine gossip and you also get uh, the story or the re quote unquote the real story like you might read in the tech press about a particular acquisition going down a particular way or an investment round happening or something like that and it has a particular 
ordinary interpretation. Then you go to somebody who was in the room when it happened, and then they give you the real deal of what actually happened and who cut who out, who stabbed who in the back. So that's kind of like neither neither is necessarily more true than the other. There's a I think there's a temptation to take uh, the grapevine view as more true simply because it's based on like subjective direct access and like perhaps secret information. Mm -hmm. But we forget that because the grapevine view also has all the subjective filters, it's also more unreliable in a very different way because it's like if you're hearing a story or a bit of gossip about what happened in a boardroom three degrees removed, that's three career lenses through it. Like there's a failure who's frustrated at the industry, who's, who told the story to some guy who's like optimistic about the industry, who told the story to a woman who has a third triangulation of the guy in the room. And then you have these three filters applied. And yes, you get like a close up view of what happened, but it's also like three subjective filters applied. So you have to like account for that. So it may not necessarily <laughs> be more true than the news version, right? So, uh, but it's a, but it's interesting because it's a like what I was just asking. But, would you say you're a big gossip? No, <laughs> I'm a medium gossip. I would say I like gossip. I love hearing gossip. I don't know if I'm very good at giving out gossip. I think I could get better at that. <laughs> um, but I wanted to bring what you just said back to our graphs discussion. Um, mm -hmm. You were calling a grapevine, but I feel like another term you can use for the graph is a graph. Um, a grapevine is a graph. And um, the interesting thing about like, so one of the things that I talked about at Refactor Camp was like this observational quality to the universe and how what you observe, um, your ability to observe it colors the reality that you live in. Um, I think it's interesting because what you're basically talking about getting, it's gleaning information is getting yourself, is like making observations about reality, which may or may not be true. Like there's kind of this weird lossiness to gossip, which makes it not super reliable. Um, mm -hmm. But it is interesting that it's kind of doing a similar, um, it's similar work to what you do when you run a, a scientific experiment and attempt to observe the results, except instead you're gleaning information observations that you can't make directly. So you make them indirectly through other people. Like oh, uh, build on what you just said. This is a kind of observation that's kind of like quantum in the sense that you will kind of affect the state you're observing by participating in the gossip mode. Like if I read a newspaper article about something that happened, I don't affect that reality because it's a purely one way transmission and I'm a spectator. Mm -hmm. But to participate in a gossip grapevine means that whichever node in the graph you got your version of the story from, that person has a particular relationship with you and particular expectations and manipulations going on and you have it with, relative to them. So that la so maybe a good way to think about it is it's not a series of individual subjective filters bringing you the story. The filters are not the individuals, but the relationships in the chain of transmission. So maybe you tell me a bit of gossip about Sonia and Sonia got it from somewhere else. And it's like each relationship is one layer of filtering and you can only participate in the chain if you're actually in the chain, which means you're affecting the reality being created and observed at the same time, right? Yeah, it's very physical. It's very, it's very graphy. It's very like rule set being applied at every turn, right? Mm -hmm. like every human has a different rule yeah. set. Yeah, so I think it's a, yeah. that's a cool loop there. I'm going to loop. <laughs> cool. Right. I think we brought it back to the starting topic. <laughs> um, Venkat, it is always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, uh, thanks for coming on Scorpio season today. And uh, I guess we'll see each other next week when we talk about H's. Yep. All right. Nice talking to you again, Lisa. And you're welcome back on the show anytime. Thanks. Bye. All right. <laughs> Scorpio season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>